Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first ever Violent Game Show. This was originally going to be a podcast, so <laughs> allow me to, to, to do some introductions. This is very necessary. This is the first episode of the Violent Game Show, so I need to basically explain what this is. And in layman's terms, the way I thought of presenting this to you in a way that isn't overwhelming is that it's basically a giant let's talk where I try to cover everything that's on my mind. I'm going to talk about all the games I've kind of been playing, um, games I've beaten. I'm going to go into news topics or I'm going to regurgitate the news rather. That's what every YouTuber does now. It's kind of sad. Like everyone's doing the same thing. But I feel like I might as well give you my like casual reaction to it because I'm not a journalist. I'm just a gamer, and when this information is presented to me, I'm going to um, respond to it maybe differently than your favorite journalist would, so uh, let's get into the show. So what have I been playing this um, week? Actually, let's cover the games I've been playing for the last couple of weeks, because a lot of things have been happening this year. I've had a really good gaming season this year as well, from games in the backlog, as well as brand new games. So two games that I actually beat recently was Devil May Cry 5 and Amnesia The Dark Descent. Now, Devil May Cry 5 being one of the newer releases from Capcom, I thought this game was actually really exceptional in a lot of ways, but it didn't really meet my taste. After playing a game like Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, I was really accustomed to having to overcome this challenge when it came to action games, and Devil May Cry 5 doesn't do that. It gives you this absurdly complicated combat system that is amazing when you can pull it off well and memorize your combos and use different weapons in conjunction with each other, but... It never puts up a wall to where utilizing that combat system is necessary. And that was my biggest gripe with Devil May Cry 5. I did make a let's talk on that if you want, you know, more um, coverage in, in regards to my opinion in that matter. But I think everything else around the game is exceptional. And that's why I, I can't write this game off as a bad game. It, it really is a good game. It's one of the best Devil May Cry games I've ever played. But it wasn't in my taste. It didn't take the direction I wanted. And it kept, and it did that thing where it locked off the harder difficulties until you beat the game once. But after you beat the game once, there's really no incentive in my mind to do it again. However, I feel like some people are going to really enjoy this game and it's going to even be a game of the year contender for them because the game is a power fantasy. I, like the music and stuff, like the zaniness of it, the fact that it never takes itself too seriously, the graphics being ridiculously gorgeous, being made in the Resident Evil engine, it's just beautiful. And Capcom is really putting out good games this year. You know, Resident Evil 2 Remake was act uh, absolutely exceptional. So, you know, Capcom, good record so far. But yeah, I felt, I felt the game was too easy, and I would love to hear if you're a Devil May Cry fan. Leave a comment and tell me how you think this game, you know, holds up to 3. I still think Devil May Cry 3 is the best in the series. I really do, even though I love Dante in Devil May Cry 5. He's probably one of the coolest action heroes in an action game. I'm so mad that that was hardly utilized, in my opinion. Like, I sucked at Devil May Cry 5's combat. I should have got my ass handed me, but I never did. There was never that DMC3 moment where I was like, I need to get good. And I like that. And not everyone does, and I understand that. But, yeah, all in all, it's a great game that isn't within my taste. I'm just going to leave it where I started it. So I also beat Amnesia. This was a game that was sitting my backlog for a very long time. I wasn't really into it because it was a very, very puzzly game, which wasn't what I was looking for in a horror game. But I finally decided to sit down and play the game for what it was, treating it more like a puzzle game than an actual horror game. And I found it really enjoyable as a result. I felt like it made me pay more attention to my environment. I was like very more inquisitive and I love that because I feel like when I go into other games, I'm not just gonna mindlessly run through them. I'm gonna examine the environment a bit more. I like that paying attention to detail, the game rewards you for being smart. Things like that really make amnesia you know, really stand out to me. And the way that they use their environment to try to scare the player is very, very different than other horror games. And, and to be honest with you, I feel like that game is almost unparalleled when it comes to using its environment to try to shock you. However, 
if you're like me and you've played a lot of horror games, this game might not scare you. That ambience, while it is effective and it is utilized in the right ways, is not always impactful. Like when you learn that some of these noises and sound effects never lead to you ever getting hurt, you stop from being afraid of them. And it's almost as if the game is trying to convince you that something scary is going to happen, though in the back of your mind, you're like, I kind of know that, that how this game works. I know that these sound effects don't mean anything. This is just them trying to simulate Daniel's kind of insanity in a way, which is kind of cool and it really feeds on the um, paranoia aspect. I think the way they treat mental health and amnesia is really unique and some of it reflects, you know, real life anxiety in a way. Like I actually struggle with some of these issues and I, the way they kind of zoom in and out you know, kind of giving you that tunnel vision when Daniel's really stressed and about to go insane is really, really well done. And sometimes it would almost trigger my anxiety because I thought it was me doing it. And the weird crackling, that is like literally to real life. Like I hear that exact crackle when things aren't going right in my head. And I felt like that that was, that was just really well done. And, and all in all, I would say Amnesia is probably one of the best horror games ever made. But one thing that, again, kind of takes me out of the horror is also the monster design. I never found any of the monsters all that intimidating. If anything, when I saw them, it kind of made me less afraid of them. I'm like, they kind of just look a little goofy. But that could easily just be that the game was made, like, what, in the early 2000s or something like that? You know, I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I knew, so I wasn't just talking out of my ass. But Amnesia of the Dark Descent, I think, is well worth it. Now, the DLC portions of Amnesia are fucking trash, <laughs> and you should not play them. It's like everything that was good about Amnesia, they just completely ignored in the um dlcs like they were just like oh people like this um light management they like the stress mechanic leave that in there there you go i didn't like that i felt like that was kind of weak it kind of felt half-assed and yeah and it really does stand out you know maybe maybe machine for pigs is average as a horror game but it stands out like a sore thumb when you compare it to the dark descent being so well done the uh, puzzles being really very therapeutic and kind of resetting the tension you know those puzzles what they ultimately do and this does help the horror is it resets the tension so that you drop your guard because like think of outlast for example it's just jump scare jump scare jump scare running sequence jump scare running sequence running sequence and what happens from that is you kind of get fatigued from horror and it has less impact but when you have these subtle breaks of peace and calm and the music sets the perfect tone it resets your mindset so you're ready for that next scare. You're ready for that next horror segment. And yeah, I think that's really well done. Also, the story of Amnesia is beautiful. Oh my gosh. And, and you know, spoiler alert for a game that's so fucking old. But like learning about Daniel's past and stuff and how dark it was... And, you know, trying to philosophically come to grips with, like, am I a bad person? Should I be punished for this? Am I even responsible for this? Because, like, your memory was completely reset. It's like, whoa. I loved the narrative of the game. I thought it was absolutely exceptional. And I think it was definitely worth bringing up. Now, some games I've been kind of playing on the side. Um, one game that I that is totally on my back burner that, that I play literally when I'm just exhausted and can barely function is Okami HD. I think Okami, it really is the best Zelda game you've never played. It was a classic PS2 game, and sometimes the game's age does come out when it comes to some of the environments being kind of bland or there not really being any content in certain spaces, but... It's just a great game for its time, and you really can tell. And, and a lot of things hold up today, but some of the things in Okami HD really do feel like they kind of just ported it over. Like, for example, you can't adjust your camera sensitivity, and it's unbearably low in that game. You, you're going to be very reliant on the camera's auto-snap feature where you click down the stick and, you know, cause the camera to shift. 
Though I want to bring up that I've been playing it on the Switch in particular because the Nintendo Switch is just the perfect platform for Okami. I found that the art style on uh, expanded screen made me nauseous and having it on that small screen just feels so appropriate for Okami. And like the HD rumble in the Joy-Cons matching the um, footsteps of um, Amaterisu going through that was just really, really exceptional it, it makes the experience better it's very weird but playing on the nintendo switch for certain games really does make the game shine also i love the art style like it, it's based off of japanese paintings and it's just really unique there's a lot of japanese centric culture references in there some japanese like sexual humor makes its way into the game and, and it's cool to see that cultural contrast being someone from the west so I really like Okami HD. I've been enjoying it so far. Still haven't beaten it, but it's definitely that game I'm going to play when I just need something to wind down. It's really appropriate for that. Um, what else have I been up to? I've been up to something else. I don't know why my brain is completely failing me. Oh yeah, Rainbow Six. How did I forget Rainbow Six? I've been playing that game almost predominantly up till this point. Because I've just been really enjoying it. After playing Sekiro, I really got a flavor for challenge. And I feel like Rainbow Six is like the perfect example of a hard learning curve in a multiplayer setting presented in a way that I love. I really love FPS games. I love games with high graphics and frame rate. Rainbow Six Siege is all of that. It's got that um, checkerboard 4K on the PS4 Pro. It's got 60 frames per second. It has complexity on complexity on complexity. You really can't find like another multiplayer game like Rainbow Six Siege. And that's why it garners this huge community that continues to grow. And the updates that come out for this game are absolutely outstanding, usually fixing um, problems that are just like really, really bad or like gimmicky. They're constantly balancing the game weapon wise and operator wise. And they're constantly taking community feedback. They're constantly investing in that community though granted not as much the console scene which i think might actually be a problem maybe i should talk about that a bit but overall rainbow six siege is just so freaking exceptional because of that complexity because the, there is no aim assist and i fucking hate aim assist and i feel like it has no place in a competitive setting it completely disables it no one's allowed to use it i think that is probably the number one reason while i will never play another multiplayer game unless it even tries to like it, it needs to not have aim assist is what i'm trying to say i'm trying to say something that makes this sound overly complicated to make myself sound smarter fuck that <laughs> it just needs to have no aim assist <laughs> I like having to learn, I, like, like I want to be, I want video games to kind of challenge us. I, I feel like if you don't let your video games challenge you, you're not going to gain anything from it. It's just like watching a movie at that point. And I feel like not taking advantage of that interactive medium, making your brain overcome certain obstacles. You're losing the benefit of playing video games in the first place. So, you know. That's how I see it. Now, don't get me wrong. You can use video games for things like stress relief or whatever. That's fine too. But I think it's important to keep in mind that if you play games that don't challenge your brain, you're just destroying it. Uh, a perfect example is there was a study done on like different types of games and what effect they had on their brain. I need to find this study so I can quote it. But basically, the consensus of the study was that games like Mario or puzzle games did engage players' minds and actually help them, you know, with other thinking processes. When you learn something, your brain is like a muscle, you know, it's kind of flexing. And if you don't learn something and you let the game kind of take you for a ride, you actually have the opposite effect. Perfect example is Call of Duty. Call of Duty, because it's so like run around, not really thinking, not really planning, just reacting to things, over time, it actually was found that it degrades the gray matter in your brain. And that is not going to happen in Siege. You're constantly having to learn. You're constantly having to reinvent what you're doing to adapt to the situation. You're having to, you know, make use of vertical play in a way that no other map allows you to do. The way you can interact with the map in Rainbow Six Siege is more impactful than in any game I've ever seen. Maybe Battlefield... 
you know, some of the better Battlefield games might emulate that better, but in Siege, it just matters so much more. And another thing about Rainbow Six Siege that I love that it, other games don't do, there is no jump button. There's no assholes jumping around the corner doing that to prevent um, themselves from being headshot, and I'm very happy about this. The jump button just makes people act retarded in video games, and it does add a sense, or it does make you feel a bit more grounded when you play that game, and it kind of changes the way you think about it. You have to think about sight alignment when you go down a hallway, where to aim your gun, where players can be, where you should drone. You're not just ADSing and running around a map in Rainbow Six Siege. You're using all of these intricate gadgets. You're using, again, vertical play. Uh, I can't really go any more in-depth about Siege. I think it's the best multiplayer game ever. And if you are a fan of that challenge, like I am, you have to play this game. There is no game like it. It is by far the best multiplayer game I've ever played. I, I can say that confidently. I've played it extensively. I fucking suck at it. But that's kind of the beauty of it to me. I feel like there's always more to learn. And because of that um, complexity, there's constant replay value. You never feel like you know 100% what is happening, what's going on. Every round feels different. So that's what I have to say about Rainbow Six. Another game I've kind of played around with this week was Octopath Traveler. And i got to be honest, guys, I put this on the back burner so hard. And it's not because I don't like Octopath Traveler. It was actually one of my favorite games last year because I love the writing and I love the way the mechanics work. It's not so overbearing for a JRPG. But at the same time, as an adult with a finite number of hours, it's hard to commit to a JRPG. Like when I was younger... I loved fucking JRPGs. JRPGs, to me, were like the coolest thing ever. I played the shit out of Pokemon, and that introduced me to games, and I had to learn base level mechanics, and it kind of opened me up to who I am as a gamer now. So I really have respect for JRPGs, but as an adult, the grinding, the constant leveling, the absurd amount of content, I feel like I just can't completely play this game without it being interrupted by something else that I'm more into. And that's kind of the problem I'm running into with JRPGs. I'm starting to rethink um, how I even play those games. It's kind of hard to manage, but I'm going to try because I think Octopath is exceptional. But like, I don't know. It's just not what I'm looking for right now. JRPGs having that too much grindiness to it. And it's not um, its not like you're learning anything during these grinds. It's more, more or less you're just kind of going through it. But yeah. Um, I am stuck on a boss, though. There is a boss in Tressa's story that is just molesting me right now. I think it's like her second boss or third. Look, it's been <laughs> I, I've had to take too many breaks from this game. I have trouble keeping up with it myself. But Octopath is still amazing because of that pop up art style. It's basically 2D sprites with like modern effects from the Unreal Engine. So you'll have like really good looking weather effects good lighting and shadows and it almost it's like this weird contrast that creates this pop-up book style of aesthetic it almost makes you wish the uh, fucking switch had a 3d button it really does that game is a very unique and the music oh my god the music is so good whoever did the music for that game oh it's just it's so good the battle music is good the mu the, the uh, uh, um the environmental music is really good too. Like when you're in a, uh, an area, it sets the tone so well and adds this sense of grandeur that otherwise wouldn't exist in a two-dimensional space. Like it adds so much to the game. Like it does so many things right. Like I can't ignore Octopath. I want to beat it at least once with the four characters I have right now. And that's what I'm trying to do. So moving into other topics, I kind of want to regurgitate the news. Let's 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 go into the bottom of our gut and let's get that news out there. I, I watch YouTube like you guys do, and that's how I garner most of my information. This one comes mainly from Jim Sterling, and he's talking about the microtransactions in Borderlands 3. Now, before I, I fucking get into this, and, and I said the fuck word because I'm angry, let's take a second... <laughs> And I just want to say I love Borderlands 2. I think Borderlands 2 especially is a game I hold in high regards. I had some of my favorite gaming experiences with people playing Borderlands. And 
I just love this series. I think Borderlands 2 is definitely the pinnacle. Gage the Necromancer especially. I, I love Gage. I love her mechanics. The anarchy mechanic is just so fun. So Borderlands 3 is announced and everyone's hyped about it. And Randy Pitchford comes out on a stage and says that there will be no microtransactions in it. Only there are microtransactions in it. Like, what the fuck? Why are you trying to ruin Borderlands for me? I really hate microtransactions, guys. I think it's bullshit, and it doesn't have any place in a video game. Oh, but it's only cosmetic. You don't need... No. Cosmetics have been a part of Borderlands since the first fucking game, and they were free. You're literally nickel and diming your customer base. Not only are you pulling the um, Epic Store exclusivity bullshit that pisses off PC gamers, but now you're adding in paid-for cosmetics in a game where unlocking those cosmetics used to be a part of the game's replay incentive. It really pisses me off because it's like game developers don't have a sense of integrity anymore. They're just trying to take cash from people who can't help themselves. And that's what this is. It's predatory fucking business practice because people like you and me aren't going to buy it. You know, if we don't have the money to do it, we're not going to buy it. We're sensible human beings. But there are some people who, like my brother and like his friend, they cannot control their urges to purchase these things. It is very, very addictive. And I've seen it sink its claws into people. And I think it's predatory. I think it's unnecessary. And like, think back, think back like maybe five, six years when, when, when like this shit didn't exist, it wasn't necessary and it still isn't. You know, if you want to if you want to charge us for like digital content, make meaningful DLC or make a meaningful character. People will pay for that. And I won't get mad about that cuz developers put time and effort into that. But don't make me pay for a fucking hat. Don't make me pay for a fucking outfit. You have no integrity if you do shit like that. It just pisses me off because I love Borderlands. And when this type of shit is in the design of your game, it affects the game as a whole. It just does. It always has. It innately affects the design of the game. It means the cosmetics that you probably unlock won't be as good because they want you to buy that shit. And that's frustrating because cosmetics, like, let's be honest, are a part of the experience. Like if you, if you have the ability to make your character represent you in a multiplayer setting where you're interacting with other people, that's a pressure. You want to look cool. You want your character to represent what you like in your real life, maybe have the best color palette, the best outfit. You know, like what if there was like a violinist themed thing in, in that paid DLC? I would feel pressured to buy it because that's kind of like my persona. Like I play violin and I play video games and I love them both vehemently. I just don't, look guys, fuck microtransactions. You deserve better. Like did God of War charge you for microtransactions? Was that game well received? Did they ask for more from its player base? No, and they delivered more content. They gave you a new game plus mode, didn't ask for it. Sony believes in integrity in their games, I guess, and no other fucking company does. It just drives me crazy. People ask why I play PS4. That's fucking why. Because <laughs> they put out exclusives and they don't ask me for m money. <sighs> so that's upsetting about Borderlands. I just hope the game's good. I hope Borderlands 3 is a good game. I want to support it. But this really fucking... Just... <laughs> For, to have Randy Pitchford come out on stage and be like, there are no microtransactions, only for there to be microtransactions, and to watch a grown man kind of be like, games media is blowing this out of proportion. No, you fucking lied, Randy. Fuck yourself. Get out of here. No one's stupid. You think we're dumb? Do you think we're retarded? Are you out of touch? Like, do you... You understand the opinions of these things, right? Have you looked into it? He talked, he even references Jim Sterling's name in an interview at one point in time. So he clearly looks into this shit. Why does he think we're stupid enough to fall for his bullshit? I have no idea. It's disrespectful. You know, that's why I'm mad. I feel like I've been, they spat right in my fucking face and I'm just passionate about this game. I love Borderlands. I love the way that two really took what Borderlands 1 was and made it more interesting and added layers, added more dialogue. <sighs> I'm sad. I'm sad. What else What else happened in the news? Oh yeah, the PlayStation 5 specs. This is kind of older news, but it's pertinent to me. And um, 
what's to be said about the PlayStation 5? I mean, it looks like a monster based on what everyone's saying. I'm not going to go into the specs because I don't even really know what it means. And if I can't communicate to you what that means, I don't feel like I should talk about it. But it's basically going to be a monster, and there are some pieces of evidence to suggest that. So first off, we have the, a modern game, Marvel Spider-Man. They actually did a fast travel that would take 15 seconds to do on the PlayStation 4 Pro. It took like 0.8 seconds. So that's a significant jump. And then there's a lot of references in regards to ray tracing and things like that. Having really, really awesome lighting does set the tone in a very meaningful way. I've played a lot of games where that has been the case, and I'm really excited for that. Like, for example, in Dishonored 2 on the PS4, the lighting effects were dimmed down because the PS4 couldn't handle it. But when I played the PS4 Pro version, I saw those lighting effects the way the developers intended, and it just made the environment pop so much. So hearing that we're going to have things like ray tracing and stuff and unique particles, it just makes me really excited for what games are going to turn into. I think the 4K60 era is what we're heading towards because these machines are strong enough to hold 60 frames per second, and that is why I'm really, really excited for the PlayStation 5. Now there are some concerns because Sony has also said in the past that they really want to focus on VR, which I think is just a bad move. Now I don't think VR as a whole is going to be bad. I think what they're thinking of doing with the headset is making it a wireless rig and they're going to try to make better controls for it. I'm all for it. Don't get me wrong. I want VR to be successful, but I don't think VR should take precedent over the games they're currently making like Last of Us 2 or Ghosts of Tsushima or any of their triple A bangers. They've just been quadruple A bangers, really. Like Sony has been putting out some of the best games I've ever fucking played. Like God of War is the best, the new God of War anyhow. I, like they called it God of War. That's why I said that. So God of War being the best in the series, being so innovative and being a game that I, it feels like I've never played a game like this. Just being so unique and then offering different levels of challenge, being so accessible and just so awesome and sense of grandeur. That's what is meaningful to me. Like those are experiences I cannot miss out on and Sony needs to focus on that because if they just have a box with good third party support and VR, I don't know if I'm going to stick with them, but I don't know. They have a great track record so far, and Microsoft hasn't produced a single game this console generation. So, like, Sony kind of has my um, faith, but I'm going to keep an eye on them. Because I do believe the new Xbox is probably going to come out stronger, probably a bit pricier, maybe by $100 or $200. But it's probably going to either be significantly stronger because of that price point but if it's marginally stronger and only offers you know lackluster exclusives like sea of thieves and state of decay i'm not going to be interested i go where the games are you know that's where i am in the heart of hearts but i really am excited for next gen because you can see with current gen games the struggle they're having right now like like sekiro for example i loved sekiro that game sweat my fucking ps4 like my ps4 sounded like it was about to fucking take off it was like Vroom. i was like oh shit is it gonna start flying around the room and bouncing off the walls like i was like oh shit what is happening and it really does show that this hardware needs to be replaced and having a higher frame rate for those action games is just going to make the game feel that much better imagine having 60 frames in sekiro if you were one of my console plebs that couldn't play it like for real though I loved that game. That game was so fucking good. But just imagine having 30 more frames of animation and being able to parry more successfully because that's what you're going to get when you get that higher frame rate. You're going to have more frames of animation to react to, to respond to, that is going to allow you to have a better experience with these fast-paced games if they're going to keep up this pace. I don't think 30 frames per second is going to cut it, and I honestly think that the console version of Sekiro is slightly harder because of that um, 30 frames per second and below GIMP. 
because the game does dip frame rate and like I said it really shows that these consoles are nearing the end of their life cycle. Games are starting to get ahead of them and it's time to evolve and I'm excited. I'm a happy gamer. I think this console generation was just exceptional and it continues to be exceptional because there's just this big backlog of games that I haven't even played, I'm never going to be bored. It's not going to happen. If no games came out for the rest of the year, I'd probably be content. I don't want that to happen, but like, you know what I'm saying? There's so many games available to us as consumers that it's it's just fucking awesome. We, have, we almost have too many options, and you really need to be selective as to what you play. So before I leave here, I want to, you know, discuss a topic. I want this to be a part of a violent game show where we discuss a one gaming-related topic that just kind of encompasses multiple things. And today, guys, I just want to keep it simple and let's talk about your health for a second. Because if you are an enthusiast gamer, there's a lot of us out there who, like, I hate to fucking say it, don't take care of yourselves. And I feel like this is not only hindering your health in the long run, you're, you're, you know, you're fat, you're slow, those are the obvious things, but it's also affecting your enjoyment of life. And it's something that I'm really passionate about because I, I wasn't always a good example of this and I still struggle to this day, but you have to do something physical with your body. You have to make sure you're getting your exercise in. I'm not saying you have to join a sports team. I'm not saying you have to do anything, but you need to get exercise. It's important to your happiness and your well-being. Like there'll be times where I'll just be sitting around and if I didn't do my workouts and stuff, I would just get depressed for no reason. I would start, those thoughts would creep in my head where I'm like, you're not good enough. You're a piece of shit. Nothing you do is successful. I mean, why <laughs> some of that's true, but while some of that's true, I don't feel like it makes me less of a human being. You know what I'm saying? And you have these negative thoughts you otherwise wouldn't have if you're not taking care of yourself. If you're not pushing yourself, if you're not putting yourself through some adversity, you're brain will kind of make it up itself. I don't know how it works. It's a psychological thing. But if you don't have adversity in your life, you're going to create it because humans, we have it in our DNA to overcome adversity. And we also have it in our DNA to be physical and to be active. And I'm telling you guys, when you do that workout and you wear yourself out and you push yourself and you try to make yourself better, doing that when you sit down to play a video game, it's like you have a clearer head. It's like you've taken the veil off. You know, you're not as blind. You're more aware of what's going on around you. You're more motivated. You're more attentive. You're more mindful. And I feel like you cannot maintain that mental state unless you are healthy, unless you have your health, unless you're taking care of yourself and, you know, going out there, being social. All of these things are important. So I want you guys to consider your health for today. I think it's really important if you're a gamer and you're like, man, I've been really slacking on the cardio and I've been bored with my games lately. The reason you're getting bored and upset with your games is because they aren't challenging you and you aren't challenging yourself. If you're unhappy, you're unhealthy, you cannot be happy. You cannot reach the pinnacle of happiness without having your health. Trust me. Like when I went from not doing cardio to doing cardio, there was this initial startup where I was like, fuck, this hurts. Fuck, this is painful. I hate doing this. Breathing the oxygen in my lungs is just so fucking painful. But after you get through that enough times and you sit down after exhausting yourself, you're more ready to enjoy everything around you. You've taken care of yourself and you have more energy. You have more stamina. <laughs> in multiple aspects. I don't know if I want to get into all the aspects, but it's just important, guys. Take care of yourselves. Make sure you eat right, you know, exercise. That's really something I want to stress in the first Violent Games episode. I do have a video game kind of talking about this in my episode on gaming fatigue. If you go on my Let's Talk um, playlist on my channel, you can find most of the things I'm going to reference here. I organize it that way. So if you ever want to find something of, of mine where I'm discussing something in a general topic, focusing only on one topic, head to that Let's Talk playlist. I have so many different videos there. Anyways, guys, this is Violent Game signing off for the first Violent Game show. I think I've reached about 30 to 40 minutes, which is pretty solid. I think that's pretty solid being a one-man show. I Again, I was originally intending this you know, to be a podcast where I could bounce off of other people that wasn't the case due to some circumstances, my inability to get a co-host, really, just lacking that. And 
yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. This is basically a giant let's talk. And uh, yeah, keep enjoying video games, guys. Video games are fucking awesome. But don't let them control your life. You have to fucking moderate everything, you know? Do that exercise, I'm telling you. If you're in a rut right now, and you're like, fuck, my life sucks, my job sucks, my girlfriend sucks, my friends suck, you need to just get out there. I'm telling you, it'll clear your head up, you'll appreciate other things more. The endorphins need to be released in your body. You need to do that as a person because it's in your DNA. You need to challenge yourself in some aspect. And you need to have a degree of mastery in something as well. I feel like that's also really important. I, I, I've always brought up that violin really helps me with video games. And it, it has grounded me in certain ways as a person. And I've been able to apply some of the same learning principles that I've you know taken from violin to video games. You know, it's like that Eastern um, saying. I don't know if it was Sun Tzu who said it, but it's like, once you become a master, oh, I'm not even a master. Once you become adept at something is what I will say. Once you become somewhat skilled at something, you will see it in all things. And that is so true. Like, I, I can't tell you how many times, guys, I've heard a song on the radio and I'm like, I wonder if I could play that in violin. And I'll go home and I'll try a, a couple different no, uh, different notes and I'll be like, it works. And it's so fun. Anyways, guys, this is Violent Games signing off. Have a good one. Enjoy your lives. Get some fucking exercise, you lazy shits. <laughs> It'll make you happy, trust me. I'm doing this because I love you.